I would like to begin with a first analysis. Suburbia and Flanders is increasingly facing ecologic, economic and social challenges. The two infographics on the slide focus on infrastructure. The one on the left visualizes how 14.2% of all surface in Flanders is paved. This makes us the concrete champion of Europe. The right visualization illustrates how the costs of maintaining all this infrastructure is 10 times higher in a suburban than in an urban context. These costs make planning professionals and policymakers claim that suburbia needs to transform. As you can read on the left, our former Flemish government architect states that building detached buildings should be considered criminal from now on. The right diagram estimates how many billion euros the government could save if we would stop the ongoing suburbanization process. Luckily, we know how suburbia needs to transform. We need to do more with less space, meaning we need to densify and diversify our suburban environments. And we need to introduce more collective dwelling models. In short, we need to make suburbia more urban. Planners and policymakers have been claiming this for decades now. And we did have some impact in preserving valuable nature areas and agricultural land from being built upon. But at the same time, our models and strategies could not stop the growth of suburbia. Most people in Flanders still dream of a detached single family house located in a quiet and green environment. Taking some distance, a possible reason for the poor impact of our efforts might be that we focused on the wrong leverages. With this scheme, Donella Meadows explains the principle of system thinking and argues how in order to, ch to change a system, it is not enough to change the physical parameters. One also needs to change the underlying system structure and culture. Applied to suburbia, it's not enough to simply add more buildings on less space what we may have been trying to do so far. We also need to work on the underlying dwelling culture. If we then focus on this dwelling culture, then we see that it's very dynamic. People change and so do their dwellings, dwelling needs and aspirations. To meet these needs and aspirations, they transform their houses and their neighborhoods. For instance, two neighbors sharing their garden so that children can play together or a company turning its garden into a playground for the neighborhood. We planners want to transform suburbia. Well, it is already transformed. If you want to follow meadows and steer this dynamic dwelling culture, we need to understand it first. If we zoom in on these transformations, we can distinguish two categories. Spatial transformations, like an inhabitant turning his front garden into a vegetable garden, or social ones, like a collective turning from a party collective into a caring collective during COVID. This brings us to our second conclusion. Those suburbia might already be transforming, and though some of these transformations do address some of the ecologic, economic, and social challenges that we started off with, things transform too slow and too ad hoc, as these two images illustrate. Where does that leave us now? To put it simple, with two approaches. A first approach on the left side of the table, introducing alternative spatial principles and models. And a second approach on the right side of the table, steering the transformations already taking place. We evidently need both approaches to save our suburbs. In our article, we claim that in order to bring both together, we need to organize collective learning processes in suburbia. We relied on expensive learning developed by Engström and Sanino and simplified their seven step process into a two step process. In step one, imagining, we ask our participants involved in our learning process to imagine new transformations. In step two, relating, we ask our participants to link these new transformations to existing transformations. 
both steps expand their current way of looking at suburbia. If we apply this framework to our two approaches, then we need to enable two types of conversations. One departing from visions and models, trying to relate them to suburban dwelling cultures, and one departing from existing practices, trying to relate them to larger dynamics and challenges. In order to allow exchange between all these conversations, we work with patterns, with each pattern referring to one prototypical transformation. Think of spatial transformations like a front garden turning into a vegetable garden, or a social one like a party collective, or a turning into a caring collective. And with each iteration in our conversation, we come up with new transformations, which we translate in new patterns, resulting in a dynamic and enabling suburban pattern language. We already applied our approach in conversations with policymakers, spatial planners and residents. In the second part of this presentation, we will introduce two prototypical conversations. The first starting from the right side of the table, and a second one starting from the left side. Our first conversation is about a front garden, somewhere in a suburb. As you can see on the right image, it is very paved. As a first step of our conversation, we ask the participants to imagine transforming their front garden into a vegetable garden. And to then collectively assess the implications of this decision. We do this by asking them some questions related to activity theory, symbolized by the triangles in the right frame. As a result, the participants expand their conception of what a front garden could be. The result of this step is a new first new pattern, that of the vegetable front garden. As a second step, we ask the participants to relate this new transformation to existing transformations, either within or outside the neighborhood. For instance, another neighbor who recently installed a rainwater tank, a neighbor who became too old to maintain his front garden and removed all his plants, a random person who each summer turns the street into a playing street for his kids. The participants have to relate to minimum three of these transformations and imagine the implications of this coalition, such as considering a collective rainwater tank involving a professional to man manage all the front gardens in the street and so on. Again, we end up with a new pattern, this time one of a vegetable playing streets. We imagine that with each iteration, the support for larger transformations increases. So no longer on the scale of one parcel involving one actor, but involving multiple parcels and multiple actors. So no longer a vegetable front garden, but a, a vegetable street managed by a vegetable collective. Our second conversation takes place in the same suburb, but this time starts from a policy perspective. And as we argued at the start of our lecture, these typically talk about densification, diversification, and so on. In this case, collective housing. In the first step, we again ask our participants to imagine the implications of this transformation, which would require the demolition of nearly all existing housing and the building of additional dwelling units to make the project economically feasible. In a second step, we ask our participants to relate this new transformation to existing transformations in or beyond the neighborhood, such as the presence of a strong inhabitant collective the dream of this collective to build our own neighborhood center, and so on. We end with defining new patterns, this time multiple ones, as we started off with a big ambition. As our second conversation continues, we imagine that with each iteration, the radical policy vision gets more grounded, no longer involving the whole neighborhood, but engaging with the particular dwelling culture of neighborhoods. To conclude, we started off saying that these are two approaches to retrofitting suburbia. One that tries to introduce radically new spatial principles or models, and one that tries to steer the existing suburban dwelling culture. Our conversations suggest that there's a third approach, 
one that challenges both the visions and the culture by ma making people think on an in-between scale. The vegetable street instead of a vegetable front garden. A collective parking and storage space instead of a massive co-housing project. This brings me to my last slide and to the title of the paper, Designing via Detours. We no longer propose to transform suburbia via ready-made master plans or by surrendering to the suburban dwelling dream of inhabitants, but by expanding the current way of looking at suburbia by inviting participants to explore other scales and coalitions. Not random ones, but ones rooted in the culture and the history of the particular suburb. In the end, we will have increased the public value of suburbia, be it not with a predefined roadmap.